Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hello and welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, your weekly pod on how to save and make more money. My name is Michelle Baltazar. I'm the editor-in-chief here at Money Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Well, we've got a special guest today who will share with us some practical tips on how to be more productive at work and, in her own words, explain how work doesn't have to suck. And I know we've all been there. Don't lie. Later in the episode, we'll chat about the importance of knowing your chronotype and how that can help you excel at work too. You probably know her from her phenomenally successful business podcast, How I Work, which has been downloaded more than 5 million times, where she interviews some of the world's leading innovators about their habits, rituals, and strategies for structuring their day. So her name is Dr. Amantha Imber, psychologist, founder of behavioral science consultancy Inventium, and author of a new book called TimeWise. Amantha, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. No worries. So let's get straight into it. The Australian Bureau of Statistics reported in the latest census that there are 7 million Australians working full-time and 4 million working part-time with most of us working an average of 38 hours a week. So that's an awful lot of time. Tell us, why have you made it your life's work to unpack how we spend our day working and specifically how successful people do it? Well, like something I always wondered before I started the How I Work podcast is that we've all got the same amount of hours in the day. But then there are people who are insanely successful that have risen to the top of their field and others who have not. And I began to wonder, like, given we've all got 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week, are these people using their time differently? And, you know, about 500 episodes into how I work now, the answer is definitely yes, they are using their time differently to the rest of us mere mortals. What? That, that's that's just unfair. Like, can't we just all kind of watch TV, lie around, and still be successful? <laughs> if only. Oh, there, there should have. I should have had that as as different section in the book. But uh, no, <laughs> that's not an answer. A quick rundown then on you know maybe your three key observations on how they structure their day differently. Well, I think at a high level, they're really intentional with how they use their time. Whereas I think for a lot of us, we can be quite mindless um, in, in how we spend the minutes and the hours in our day. Like for the average person, myself included, it's really easy to get into an Instagram black hole and arise from it an hour or two later. It's also really easy to somehow become glued to the couch when you need to binge watch succession so that the finale doesn't get spoiled for you. Like this is sort of, you know, how the average person um, often uses many of the hours in our our day. So a, a really important differentiator is being intentional with how you use your time um, is, is a really big lesson for me. All right. So being intentional and also the value of time. I know that you have a section in your book where you talk about an hour that is worth $10,000 versus an hour that is worth $10. Explain that to us. So I got this tip from Perry Marshall, who's one of the most successful and in-demand consultants in the world. And he talks about thinking, like breaking down your day in terms of what is the value of the tasks that you're completing? So, you know, for example, um, for the How I Work podcast, there's a lot of administrative stuff uh, that, that that myself as one of the producers of the show have to do. Like, uploading the episode into the software that spits out the episode into all the podcast players. I would say that that is a $10 an hour task in that I could probably find someone, and indeed I have, for, from uh, from the Philippines who can take over that admin stuff for me thus freeing me up. You know, likewise, there are tasks that we do that are like $1,000 or $10,000 an hour tasks. Like if you think about, for example, a receptionist working in um, a dental practice and the phone rings and there's someone on the other end who wants to book in for, you know, a several thousand dollar procedure. If, for example, she puts that person on hold 
and, you know, maybe does a less important task or uh, something administrative that she, you know, or he thought was going to be urgent. And the caller on the other end that was about to give the dental practice $4,000 thinks, oh, I can't be bothered holding. I'm just going to hang up and call another dental practice. She's, she's made a poor choice or he has made a poor choice in their use of time because if they were to take that call and prioritise that call, that's arguably a $4,000 an hour task because that's how much money it just earned. So really thinking about, for anyone listening, what are the highest value tasks that you do? Maybe they're sales meetings. Um, you know, maybe they're creating powerful content. Uh, you know, maybe it's data analysis. And what are the low value tasks that you do that are typically more administrative and easier to outsource? And a really simple way to add more value to the organization that you work for, or maybe you're a small business owner, is to do more high value tasks and less low value tasks. I think that's that's a good point because the gig economy, which didn't exist a decade ago, is now available to everyone. You've got Fiverr, Airtask, uh, you name it. There are people with the right skills and they can do something in an hour, which might take someone else 10 hours, for example. But what I'm hearing from you is that it really depends on that person. What is a low value versus a high value um task for them in terms of how they divvy up their time? I mean, for me, this is not about money, but my relationship. So there are priorities. We're both busy, but I know that um, when the house is messy and we both have divvied up the household chores, it just affects our mood if some things aren't done. So prioritizing things definitely. But now with the cost of living challenges, maybe some people don't know how to outsource or can't, don't want to outsource. So what are your um, recommendations or suggestions for them? Look, if you don't want to outsource, I do always like asking the question, what can I just say no to? Or what mm. could I stop doing right. that will actually yes. have no material value on those around me? Yes. Like, for example, maybe there's a report that you have to compile once a week at work and maybe it takes you a few hours to do and it's really frustrating. And maybe what is actually happening is that no one is actually reading that report. You've just compiled that report because it's just the thing that you've always done or that you've always been asked to do. Um, but I think it's always worth asking, particularly with repetitive tasks, am I actually creating something of value that other people are using? And if the answer is no, and generally you can only find this out by speaking to those people, then just stop doing it. Um, often it just won't make a difference. Absolutely. I, I totally get it. I, I think there is a book about saying no, because this is just not something that we do naturally. We tend to say yes, but like you said, just being intentional about it is what I'm hearing from you. So let's pause right there, because now I want to talk about one of your pet topics, which is about chronotypes and what they mean. In your book, you've talked about the early lark, the middle birds and the owl. So let's talk about the early larks right now, but then majority of people are middle birds. So we'll talk about that later. So tell me, why do you think it's important for us to know what it is like as if it's our blood type? Why is that? Well, what chronotype refers to are the peaks and troughs in our energy levels over a 24 hour period. And at a high level, there are three different types of chronotypes, as you've just mentioned. So there's there's larks, who are people that you know naturally wake up at five or six a.m. without an alarm and feel great. They, they represent about sixteen or seventeen percent of the population. At the other end of the spectrum are owls. About one in five people are owls, and they're the people that really come to life at night, um, and that's when they do their their best thinking and they're most energetic. Um, which sadly for owls is when most offices and schools, for that matter, and educational institutions are closed. Yes. Um, and then everyone else is a middle bird. So about 60% of us are middle birds. So we follow the pattern of a lark just delayed by an hour or two. So for the, for the majority of us, we have a peak energy and uh, a peak alertness it, it generally before lunch. So sort of in those, in those morning hours from about nine to 12. Um, and so if you're thinking about how to structure your day, it's really good advice to do the thing that's going to require the most heavy lifting in terms of brain power before lunch. That's mm -hmm. when you'll do the best job on it. 
unless you are an owl, in which case do it towards the end of the day. Is there hope for owls to do nine to five jobs? I mean, you've said that their peak productivity happens from like 4 p.m. onwards. Yeah, look, you can change your chronotype by adjusting very gradually the time that you wake up, that you get out of bed. But, uh, you know, I, ideally owls should aim to find workplaces that that can cater for their owlness. So I'm talking about workplaces that that have some kind of flexible working policy in terms of the hours that people work. So for example, at Inventium, which is uh, my behavioral science firm, we encourage people to work to their chronotype. Um, so for example, my CEO at Inventium is an owl and I would just never set a meeting with her at 9am in the morning because I know she's not going to be at her best. And likewise, if I get an email from her in the evening or the night, I don't kind of stress out that she's working too hard. I just know that that's generally when she does her best thinking. Now, in my many years of working, no one ever refers to anyone in the office as a lark or an owl. <laughs> this is difficult because we just all assume that you do your eight hours in and that you're as productive as you can be. How is the workplace changing now, especially with remote work also available to us today? Look, I think that one really great thing that COVID did is that it it really got us crushing a lot of the assumptions that we held about how people's best work could happen. Um, it really demonstrated to a lot of managers, particularly old school managers, that you could actually trust people to work from home and be productive. And in fact, generally, in most cases, be more productive than they are in an office. And obviously, this is a generalization to white collar workers. You know, it, it also raised the bar in terms of what people can expect from a workplace, because there are quite a few workplaces that have embraced ultra flexibility. It means that those that have not actually look pretty poor in comparison. And when you're trying to attract the best people, you you want to be a workplace that that can give employees the best and most flexible experience. So at Inventium, for example, for the last three years, we've been doing the four-day week where people are paid their full-time salary, but they're only expected to work for normal length days, provided that they are 100% productive, that they produce the output or outcomes that would be expected from a full-time worker. And like you said, that really needs to be structured because a lot of us are just kind of mindlessly doing the eight hours, not really thinking about productivity. Now, you mentioned COVID and there is a new phrase called quiet quitting. Tell us, what, what are your thoughts about this where people are intentionally trying to be less productive at work? Look, I think if if you're someone that can relate to the idea of quiet quitting, then like perhaps it might be time to look for another job. I mean, we spend like about a third of our waking lives as adults at work. And it's sad to just kind of feel like you just want to, or like feel like you're sort of squandering that time and just kind of hoping that it goes quickly and not putting in your full effort. Like ultimately that's not going to feel very fulfilling to you as an individual if you're quietly quitting And it's certainly not going to help with career prospects, dare I say. So I think it's probably a signal that if you can feel yourself quietly quitting or if that idea really appeals to you, and by all means, you know, we all have days where we're not working at our best and where we, you know, could do with just a lighter load. And and that's, I mean, that's that's human. But if it's every single day where you're attempting to quietly quit um, in terms of your behavior, then for me, that's probably a signal that maybe you're just not happy at this organization or working for this manager or working in this particular team of people. And maybe it's a sign to to move to somewhere else, to find somewhere else where you are going to be feeling more energized to be at work. Ooh, some hard truths there, Amantha. And, and certainly because we are trying to give our listeners more tips about making money, you're less likely to progress or get the pay rise or negotiate from a very strong position if, if you're not putting in the input. And like you said, you know, being more productive at work. That's right. Um, you know, certainly if you are someone that that is ambitious and wants to rise up the ranks, yet you're finding yourself in a job where you uh, are doing some quiet quitting, uh, I would definitely recommend 
trying to find somewhere else that is a better fit with the the things that you enjoy, the values that you hold and, you know, what another organization might be able to offer. Well said. So earlier in the pod, you said that um, people need to be more intentional about their time. And I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But just one last tip. You've interviewed so many successful people in arts, culture, film, business. What is something that our listeners can do today that can maybe change their lives or improve their working lives? It's a great question. Um, you know, and, and look, when, when I was thinking about this interview, I was thinking about what, what's some of the advice that I've heard about how we can use money more more wisely. And I think a, a really good one for me um, that I try to think about a lot is to buy now, but consume later. Mm. Kind, of, kind of the opposite to how credit cards work. Um, so what research shows is that we can increase our happiness if we pay for something now, but we, we have to wait to have that thing that we bought in, in the future. Like a holiday is a classic example of this. Um, my advice for planning holidays is to book your holiday far in advance, not just because of cost savings, but because a lot of the happiness that comes from the experience of going on holiday is the anticipation. You know, this mm. also works for products as well. So, yeah. you know, putting a deposit on an expensive item, for example, or even a non-expensive item will make you appreciate and bring you more happiness towards that thing, you know, if you pay it off in parts before actually gaining access to that thing that you've bought. So, so some advice there in terms of how how we can use money to buy ourselves a bit more happiness. I like that. Amantha, thank you again for your time today. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Well, there's more of all that good stuff on Amantha's podcast, How I Work. It's the number one ranking business podcast right now, so you can't go wrong by adding it to your list of podcasts. And before we go, please don't forget that if you enjoy listening to the Friends With Money podcast, we'd love for you to recommend it to your own friends and family, or you can help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can also send us any questions, comments, or even ideas on how you're more productive at work on our podcast email, podcast at moneymag.com.au. And finally, make sure you head over to moneymag.com.au for all the latest financial news and stories. That's it for this episode. I'm Michelle Baltazar. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Friends With Money podcast. For credible, independent and easy to understand financial commentary, visit moneymag.com.au. Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.